Welcome to tonight's Dean Speaker Series event, Thriving Amidst Adversity, a conversation with Professor Scott Galloway, NYU professor and Haas alum. We're very excited and thankful to have Scott with us tonight. My name is Johanna Lewis. I am the VP of Alumni for the full-time class of 2021 MBA Association. I'm also here with Jeff Easterling, who I'll let introduce himself. Jeff? Hey, thanks, Johanna. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Easterling. I'm the full-time MBA MBA president at the Haas School of Business. And it's my honor to introduce our Dean, Dean Ann Harrison, to introduce our esteemed panelists and kick off the events this evening. Thanks, Jeff. Um, it's such an honor to be hosting this event. Let me start by saying good evening to all of our students, our faculty and staff who are on this with us. Um, and a really special welcome to our alumni who are joining us tonight and our admitted students. Um, it's really great to have you joining us for tonight's Dean Speaker Series. Uh, we're, we're really excited about our speaker tonight. Scott Galloway is one of our own. He's an MBA out of the Haas full-time program from 1992. Um, Scott has remained close to Haas over the years in a lot of different ways. He served on our board um, he gave, he's been giving a lot of his time as well as supporting the school. Uh, thank you so much, Scott, for everything that you've done and are doing for the school. The thing about Scott, he also really makes us think. Um, he's the quintessential questioner of the status quo. And uh, while it's always important uh, to have that, that in a leadership um, position, there's no better time to hear from a leader who's challenging us to look at the world in new ways. Let me tell you a little bit more about Scott. He's a proud product of what he says is the generosity and vision of the University of California Regents. What that means is that he went to UCLA as an undergraduate and he was there on a Pell Grant scholarship and then he got his MBA at Haas. Um, he also, with his MBA classmate, Ian Chaplin, he founded the strategy firm Profit. Since then, he's founded a number of other firms, Red Envelope, L2 Inc. His latest company is what he is called Section 4. He's written two books, The Four and The Algebra of Happiness. He's also a professor of marketing at NYU Stern. More, more recently, yesterday, Vice TV announced that Scott's going to be the host of a new business TV show named after his newsletter, No Mercy, No Malice. Um, and just to give you a sense of Scott's sense of humor, here's what Scott said about his new show. Out of every crisis, voices help us understand how we can build a better future, but I'm not one of those voices. That's Scott's humor. Um, but he also said, we aim to speak truth to power and deliver a data-driven, unfiltered look. Scott is all about telling us the truth in an unfiltered way. I'm so excited that he's here with us tonight. Um, I could go on and on, but I'm going to leave it there. I know we're all very eager to hear from Scott himself. So Johanna, it's back to you. Great. Thank you, Dean Harrison. Uh, I also want to remind viewers that they can submit questions at any time through the YouTube chat function. We'll be doing a Q&A at the end of this session so Scott can hear directly from you. So Scott, are you with us? I am, and thanks so much, uh, Joanna, and thanks so much for your generous uh, words, uh, Dean Harrison. Great. Um, so we're so great to have you, and we'd like to start actually by hearing a bit about you. How is life in quarantine for you? What is keeping you occupied? And if I may say, sane? Uh, I think so quarantine for me personally is fine. I'm a bit of an introvert, so I don't mind being in isolation. Uh, but I think like a lot of families, uh, we're struggling in the sense that in our specific instance, our youngest, our nine-year-old is really struggling. The absence of socialization and structure and school has really strained him. And as anyone with kids will tell you that when when your kids isn't doing well, it, kind of the whole family comes to a grinding stop. So, you know, it's 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 uh, we're blessed. I'm not worried about paying my mortgage. We're all healthy. So the important stuff is good. But, 
Yeah, I think we're gonna. I think there's a lot of families across America that are really struggling with this because I think it, this is sort of the largest unintended experiment on isolation. And uh, one of my kids is having a difficult time with it, which puts a real strain on the family. Uh, so, look, but the headline news is we're fine, but the reality is this isn't easy for us, as I imagine it's not easy for a lot of people. Right. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. Way to start it off with a bummer. Just. <laughs> Everybody down. <laughs> to bring everybody down. How are you, Joanna? <laughs> Unfiltered oh view. That's what we like to hear. And seen. That's the truth <laughs> that Dean talked about. Uh, you know, similar. I think um, every day it kind of presents its own little micro challenge. And mm. yeah, to your point, it's this grand experiment that none of us signed up for, but we're learning a lot about ourselves in the process. At least yeah. I am. I can, I can definitely speak for myself. Um, so thinking a little bit more, I guess, macro level, um, sure. would love to hear your takes on uh, the way that this pandemic is shaping our society. So if we think about this in like a glass half full and then a glass half empty view, um, what from a glass half full perspective, what about this moment is giving you hope or encouragement for our future? And conversely, what about this moment maybe is making you question um, your or what's keeping you up at night, perhaps? Sure. So look, you'd like to think that we're coming out of this, we're going to produce a generation of young people, uh, both out of the Haas community and younger people across America that observe this experience. And whereas a lot of people were saying millennials and Gen Z were this fragile generation prone to depression because of social media and helicopter parenting, that maybe after coming through this will mature a generation of leaders that realize that pandemics don't see borders that are superpowers as a species is cooperation, that institutions matter, that when you defund government, when you delegitimize institutions, that you're, you're, you're borrowing from the future and you're setting yourself up to be vulnerable. There are some very hard truths we're going to have to face here. We have 6% of the population and we're going to register about a third of the deaths, supposedly, and we have more infections than any country, despite having had more time to prepare for it, spending more money on health care. So I'm hoping that we're going to bring a younger generation up through this crisis who will develop some grit and A, maybe take stock of how important our institutions are and that global cooperation uh, uh, is important. That is, about as, that is about as half full as I can get. I'm a half empty kind of guy. Uh, but hopefully we're maturing a generation of leaders that start to get back to what's important and recognize that the wealthiest country should not have half its population so vulnerable that they can't make it 60 days without a paycheck. The wealthiest country in the world should realize that just calling people essential and not paying them a living wage doesn't foot to character as a nation. So I, I hope that a, a younger generation picks up the ball where my generation has failed and continues to borrow money from the future in the form of debt payments such that we can maintain this champagne and cocaine party of, of you know artificially inflating the markets i hope that we're i hope that this younger generation is taking lessons and uh will be a more cooperative uh more brave more thoughtful more empathetic uh generation of leaders that recognizes how important it is to invest in a global cdc how important it is to ensure that people have sustainable um, economic security. Anyways, I'm blathering on, but I hope we're gen I hope we're going to mature a new generation of leaders. Yeah, I think you're not alone in that hope. Um, also curious about kind of thinking about business trends. Um, obviously, COVID is going to reshape a lot of the way that the, the business world runs uh, and the way that some industries run. Curious what uh, trends you've been following that COVID has maybe sped up or somehow changed? Yeah, that's the right term. So there's a great um, saying that as we age, we become more like ourselves. And I think that the business world is becoming more like itself in the sense that COVID-19 isn't as much as a change agent as it is an accelerant. And I spent a lot of time, I've been in seven board meetings in the last five days, and everybody wants to know, what does our industry look like after this? And the reality is that the trends aren't that much different. They're accelerating. So in retail, we know department stores and specialty retail apparel are going to struggle. Online grocery is going from 2% to 10%. So that's literally 60 to $70 billion of grocery moving from terrestrial to digital. We know media that ad supported media is going to struggle. 
uh, and that over the top and streaming is going to probably take more. We know that Facebook and Google are probably going to emerge from this crisis with not 62 points a share, but 72 points. If you think about the mortality rate of COVID-19 being somewhere between 0.1% and 4%, depending on the region and the numbers and the denominator, it's realistic that in media and retail, COVID-19 might have a, a mortality rate of 10 to 30%. We might lose 10 to 30% of our retailers and our media companies in the next 12 months. You know, there's a lot of walking dead right now. I think the biggest shift from a, a business standpoint, if you will, will be in uh, two industries. It'll be in the two most disruptable industries as, as indicated by the size of the industry and how fast they have raised their prices relative to inflation. And the first is healthcare. And the second is the industry we're in, education. And I think we're going to see massive change in uh, healthcare and education, largely driven on what I call the great dispersion. And that is, we're learning through this crisis that healthcare and education can be delivered through without the geographic constraints of geography. And that is, I bet somewhere when the final numbers come out, we're going to find that somewhere between 97 and 99 percent of people who are infected with the novel coronavirus. Uh, were uh, identified, treated, and recovered from the virus without ever having entered a doctor's office or a hospital. And I think that is going to massively accelerate uh, telehealth or remote health. And when you think about the size of this industry, arguably the largest consumer industry in the world, U.S. healthcare, and the fact that we are dispersing it from hospitals and doctor's offices, you can see just such a massive uh, disruption, transition, reformation, rebirth of that industry. That's going to be a very exciting uh, place with a lot of winners and losers. I also think something similar is happening with campuses. And then generally speaking, uh, colleges are duopolies based on region. There's Stanford and Cal, there's NYU and Columbia, there's Chicago and, Cal and Kellogg. And then this cartel allows the second tier to charge the same rates as the first tier. And we all raise our prices four to six percent, kind of double inflation. We become a bit drunk on luxury. We brag about how difficult it is to get into our schools. And as a result, you know, education has just become a luxury good that is now out of the reach of a lot of people. And I don't want to group all universities into it. I think Dean Harrison and before her, Dean Lyons, made a Herculean effort to ensure that Cal continued to educate more and graduate more kids from low-income households than the rest of the Ivy League combined. But I would say on the whole, on the whole, graduate education or universities have kind of lost the script. And we now view ourselves as luxury brands and not as public servants. And the costs are so extraordinary that we have stuck our chin out. And a lot of, a lot of parents and kids are going to decide this fall not to send their kids to, quote unquote, a university such that they can pay $68,000 to take a bunch of Zoom classes. That's just not going to happen. And that's going to force, uh, I think, a rethinking of the price value equation around universities and potentially where I think it's headed. And I'm blathering on here, but I think really strong universities will get stronger. So the Cal's and the MIT's and the UCLA's and the, you know, the, 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 the Whartons of the world are going to be fine, but they're going to be able to double and triple their enrollments. They're going to have to lower their prices. There's just no getting around it. People don't want to pay $68,000 for a largely remote experience. Um, and a lot of this is going to be remote. Uh, so when the prices come down, the, the organizations that can capture more gross margin dollars by expanding their enrollments because their physical uh, assets aren't as stressed because more people are taking classes remotely, they'll dramatically expand their enrollments and they'll be able to because they have a waiting list of a lot of people who would like to get into the school. Harvard said it could double its enrollment without sacrificing any quality. And the question is, well, if you're sitting on a $37 billion endowment, why aren't you? So I think technology is going to allow the best to expand their enrollments and maintain their gross margin dollars. This will put dramatic pressure on, call it, universities 100 through 800, not the top 100, not the top 50, which will be fine. They'll have a dip in revenues, but then they'll come back. But we're going to see a massive disruption in, in higher education. And it's going to be the best professors are going to make a lot more money. The best universities are going to get even stronger but we're going to see tier two kind of swept off the decks here. So I think there's going to be tremendous disruption in the fields of healthcare and education, which have raised their prices faster in inflation without any underlying real increase in innovation. So uh, a lot there, but I think education and uh, healthcare are about to become very interesting sectors for graduates of the Haas School in terms of startups 
and new companies supporting this supporting this kind of dislocation, if you will. Yeah, that's really interesting and a perfect transition to my next question. Um, you know, to your point, a lot of our classmates are interested in entrepreneurship and thinking about uh, becoming founders. So how how do you think COVID-19 will impact entrepreneurship in addition to the ways you've already mentioned? You know, if you were considering a new startup or a new venture, what would be your next steps at this moment? So people romanticize entrepreneurship. I, I started uh, my first company in my second year of business school. I was inspired by my second year class of brand strategy with David Ocker. And I thought, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life. Uh, I tell kids that, especially if you're coming out of a school like Haas, if you have an opportunity to go to work for a, a great uh, company, then on a risk adjusted basis, you're better off doing that. We romanticize entrepreneurship. You know, entrepreneurship is the opportunity to sign the front of a check for two years, not the back of checks, and to potentially, you know, take a negative commission on your efforts until you either get fundraising or go out of business. It's a very difficult way to make a living. Uh, but if you're like me and you're sort of cursed to be an entrepreneur and you have to do it just the way some people are cursed to be doctors, they just have to be in medicine, then, then I would say that then the next 12 to 24 months are going to be a terrible time to be an entrepreneur. It, it, it's difficult to have a small business right now because you were sort of raised on cheap capital. You have expensive employees, expensive real estate. You have bad DNA unless you were kind of a moonshot. Um, the next, call it 12 months out from now to, another, to, to a year from now to three years from now are going to be what I call the sweet spot of starting a business. And that is I've started nine businesses and I'm generously, if I'm being generous with myself, I'm kind of three, two, and four. I've had three wins, I've had two total car crashes, and I've had four ties, and I'm being generous around the ties. And as I go through them and look at how, what, are the, what are the drivers, what is the signal from the noise in terms of discerning the winners from the losers, the only thing I can suss out of that is when I started the company. And companies I started in boom times, and lar large, arguably speaking, 2015 to February of 2020 would be by almost any metric boom times. Almost all of those companies failed. Hard to find good people. Everything was expensive. You can wallpaper over a mediocre business with cheap capital and a frothy economy. And the businesses I, I, that succeeded were started in 1991, a second year at Haas Business School when the economy was bad, in, two, in, in uh, 2009 and 10 when I started L2. When you're in a recession, you're at, the, you're at the kind of the trough, good people are less expensive, real estate's less expensive. Quite frankly, the discipline around throwing nickels around like their manhole covers sets a good DNA for the company. And as you come out of the recession, companies are willing to try new things. Companies are open to new ideas. And a lot of the kind of the stupid companies and cheap capitalists have been swept off the decks. And once the economy comes back, you have the wind at your back. You have good DNA. You have good people at a reasonable price. You know, I hired a bunch of students at NYU for L2 at 15 bucks an hour. And you say, well, you're exploiting labor. You know, they, they also owned about, you know, 10, 15 percent of a company that got sold for 160 million dollars six years later. So they did well. But in the beginning, we were running that company really, really tight. And as the economy came back in 2011, 2012, companies were willing to try new things. Uh, but yeah, starting a company in the depth of recession, going into a recession, awful time to be an entrepreneur. There's just no getting around it. This is triage right now. But in 12 to 20 to 36 months from now will be the sweet spot in the economic cycle to partner with some colleagues, to try and come up with a new idea, to be scrappy, to be in fighting shape and start a business. So I think it's a terrible time to be an entrepreneur here and now. I think it's about to become the best time in about 12 to 36 months. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, one more question for me before I hand it over to Jeff. Uh, so you're known for your predictions and you've been giving us some great ones so far. Uh, now coming from an MBA student, once again, what are your predictions for the futures of MBAs and, and the MBA job market? That's not, I don't think much about specifically about MBAs. Look, I think you're going to see a strengthening. I think that I think Haas is going to is going to triple or quadruple. I know that's I know that the 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 Dean Harrison will 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 swallow her tongue when she hears this. I think we're going to triple or quadruple our enrollment in ten years uh, because we won't be bound by our geography or our real estate. Uh, I think we're going to dramatically lower the cost of an MBA. 
And I think MBA students are going to be, I think we're going to see two or 300 programs shut down. Um, there is, there is the top schools will become, will get stronger and stronger. The second tier schools will really, really struggle. And I think we'll move probably to more intensive 12 and 15 month programs. The second year is largely an excuse to charge kids double uh, tuition. If we were honest and wanted to really prepare them for the workplace, we teach four classes in the second year and the names of the classes would be Amazon, Apple, Facebook, and Google. The summer internship is a rested adolescence and a long job interview. It's a luxury that'll probably go away. I think we're going to see more 12 and 15 month intensive programs, uh, very focused. Unfortunately, we've kind of lost, you know, the economy is getting so competitive. We've lost the, the, the luxury or the opportunity to just hang out on campus. I, I worry that the traditional campus experience is only going to become an accoutrement of the wealthy that increasingly business school and undergrad is going to become more of a trade school where, you know, it just won't be the same kind of magical experience where you get to um, experience the wonderful things about college. I think, unfortunately, that's un unfortunately that's going to be largely become a luxury item that, you know, lower upper lower middle class kids like me won't have access to. So I'm not the strong get stronger. Cal's going to be fine. Uh, but unless we have some sort of unless uh, taxpayers, unless voters decide that education is, is in fact the leveler, we're going to barrel towards this continued system of casting. Uh, cast society in Europe is based on your name. Cast society in America is based on where you go to college. There's a lot of schools where there's more kids from the top 1% than the bottom 60%. So unfortunately, uh, a lot of universities have become a vehicle for the casting of American society. So I, I, I hope that we return to our roots. I hope that we have the kind of resources and alumni and government complexion that it dramatically expands the number of seats at the University of California and we can lower the prices such that unremarkable kids such as myself have a chance to get remarkable futures. Um, I think we're in a dangerous position right now where we swipe Vaseline over the lens of graduate education in colleges by finding some incredibly remarkable kids from low income neighborhoods. But the reality is 99% of us aren't in the top 1%. And I think we need to move back to uh, uh, an environment where our, our mission is to make unremarkable kids remarkable and dramatically expand the, the number of seats. If you think about the total budget of the University of California, it went in about three hours to bailing out small companies, the majority of which are owned by millionaires or investors are owned by millionaires. I think that we have lost the script in terms of capital allocation and investing in the future. And I hope people turn their sights back to, you know, I hope we, we turn to the gestalt of American or California taxpayers and leadership in the 50s, 60s and 70s that recognize the, the, the easiest way to ensure that people have wonderful lives moving forward and opportunities is to invest in their in great education and great institutions. And I, I worry we're no longer doing that. Anyways, I didn't answer. That was a bit of a, of a meandering um, uh, answer, but. You know, I, I, I hope that I hope that that education returns to where it was for the University of California in the 80s and 90s. And that is not judging itself by how remarkable the admittees are, but how many unremarkable kids they can give remarkable opportunities to. Yeah, that's real. That's great. And I think that actually dovetails into our conversation about leadership and, and how to kind of grow oneself as a leader um, and education is a really important way to do that. I'll hand it over now to Jeff to continue with some more questions. Jeff? Thanks, Johanna. And uh, thanks again, Professor Galloway. Uh, and a small reminder to everyone that's in the YouTube, feel free to submit your questions through the YouTube chat. We'll be answering uh, and asking some of those questions in about 20 minutes. Professor Galloway, uh, I am a believer in the algebra of happiness. I, I had an opportunity when I was transitioning out of the military to see some of your conversations when you were at L2 Inc. They inspired me to move on to my MBA program. As I'm now at Haas, my classmates in the year above us are looking, you know, what does it mean to be happy in the age of Corona, in isolation and in a job market in an uncertain future? So could you apply any of the lessons from your uh, conversations around the algebra of happiness to what it means in a COVID world? Sure. So I've been thinking a lot about how you take advantage of of this or how you perform 
in this environment of quarantine. And I'll talk about professional and personal. I think this is an extraordinary uh, opportunity for what I call functional speed. And that is Jerry Rice, Hall of Fame, a uh, wide receiver, uh, was never the fastest in the combine, but he had functional speed. And that is they said he could accelerate or decelerate as well or better than any wide receiver. And it made him the best receiver in the history of the NFL. And I think of functional speed as a young professional. First off, I think young people have to dispel the notion that they're going to have any balance in their life. I think that's a myth. I think it's bullshit. I think if you expect to be in the top 10 percent, much less the top 1 percent of your chosen field for pretty much 10 or 20 years, you have to do almost nothing but work. And I realize that's not aspirational, but I have found that to be almost 100 percent true. And that's not to say that, you know, being economically successful is the end all. A lot of people decide to get off. Not, not to howl in the money train, but the majority of students I teach expect to be in those upper echelons. So one kind of acknowledge that it's just going to take a lot of work. Now, the key is when do you really accelerate? When do you really go at hard at it? And I believe we're in an era where functional speed is especially important. And that is, uh, I work with a colleague who's a strategy professor, and she talks a lot about variance. And that is, you want to invest when there's variance. And right now there's a lot of variance between some people are getting nothing done, some people are getting some things done, some people are getting a lot done. The opportunity to lap the competition has never been greater than it is now professionally. When I started L2, I used to take a team of kids with me, when I say kids, employees, to Europe during Thanksgiving, because I'm like, Europe is not closed on Thursday and Friday, and we're going to lap the competition while everyone else is eating turkey. And I know how pathetic that sounds, but I think there's opportunities to lap the competition professionally. We are in that moment. And that is, if you can figure out a way to produce IP, produce strength and relationships, sell more stuff, work harder, there is more variance. There is more opportunity right now to lap the competition when a lot of people are making no progress at all professionally. I think this is an exceptional opportunity. I'm not a workaholic. I'm outstanding and not working, but I have functional speed. And I said to my wife and to my family uh, when this started, is everyone fine? How do we support each other? Because I expect to work 18 hours a day for the next 90 days and produce just a shit ton of content and lap the competition in terms of books, articles, IP, podcasts. Uh, I'm going to put the hammer down and, and because I think you can make more progress right now professionally than, than your competition. On a personal level, I think this is an exceptional opportunity. If you think about you're in the armed services. Almost all medals and recognition are based on how you respond in times of crisis. You can spend your career being a marginal service person, but when under fire, if you show grace and courage under fire, there is a general recognition that that is an intense reflection on your character and your code. And we honor people for that. We are in a moment right now. We are in a moment of crisis. And I think it's an opportunity to take stock of who you think you are. Do you think of yourself as a generous and loving person? Well, thinking generous and loving things aren't enough. You need to be generous and loving. And if you're fortunate enough such that your family is healthy, such that you are healthy, such that you are financially secure, this is a tremendous opportunity to restore and repair and enhance relationships. You know, do you have a strained relationship with your parents? Do you not have the relationship you want with your siblings? Have you lost touch with friends because of perceived slights or bullshit ego or whatever it is? This is an opportunity to repair those relationships. This is a moment in time where your generosity, your ability to express your emotions, your ability to love other people outsizes uh, those, those expressions of love and generosity in normal times. There are a lot of people struggling. There are a lot of people who are lonely. There are a lot of people who are financially strained right now. Your ability to reach out and be who you think you are right now is, is that functional speed. This is an exceptional opportunity to decide who you are and cement that reputation. Your, you know, your, think of your tombstone. Who you are as a brand is the sum of all your actions over the course of your life, and those things will be sketched in pencil. What will be covered over those etchings and in indelible ink is how you behave and how you treat other people and the generosity you bring in crises when you are under fire. And this is one of those moments. This is a huge opportunity to repair and strengthen relationships. Wow, that's incredibly powerful. I think it's what we needed to hear right now. Uh, looking back on other 
tough times. You mentioned, you know, the early nineties, the economic bust of 2008. How did you come together with your classmates? I think the, the point about family is incredibly powerful, but you know, for my roommates, for the people I see every day, uh, walk in the halls at Haas, how can I help them right now? And how can recent alumni help each other through this crisis? So I think there's sort of different circles of help. I think the first is you have to put a, fix your own oxygen mask. They say on a plane, put on your own oxygen mask first, because if, if you aren't healthy, you can't help others. If you aren't in a good place, you can't help others. So the first is to assess openly and honestly how you're doing. And if you need help to reach out for it, and I think that's a form of courage. I think so many of us, especially men, are embarrassed to communicate our emotions and our needs that we would rather just suffer alone. So I think the first is to assess if you need help. And then if you do need help to reach out, whether it's you're struggling or you're upset or you're lonely or you're, 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 you're strained for whatever reason, I think the first is to figure out if you need help. I think the second is your immediate circle and uh, to reach out to people and not assume they're doing fine and ask how you can help and be there for them and call them maybe more often. And then if you're fortunate enough to be in a position to get off your heels and onto your toes, you know, one of the big regrets I have, I think about 9-11, I think about Katrina, and I always thought, you know, I got to get involved, I got to help, and I didn't do anything. And I'm embarrassed by that, and I'm ashamed by it. And then this crisis came along, and I thought, okay, what am I actually going to do? It's like, you know, thinking you're a generous person doesn't do anything. And so I started drawing these circles of people I knew and organizations I felt strongly about and thinking, how could I do stuff? And one of the things I came up with, and this is, I realize I'm doing a lot of virtue signaling right now. One of the things I came up with is be a baller. Uh, when I was working in, in high school and college, I was a box boy. I was a waiter. I parked cars. And on, on a regular basis, some incredibly generous man or woman would give me 50 or 100 bucks. And it was life changing for me. It meant I could go to Sizzler. It meant I could have a date. It meant I could buy the, 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 a textbook. It meant I could have a full tank of gas. People don't recognize you know, I'm, I'm an economically secure person right now. I, nothing matches. I think about when I used to have the money to fill my tank up with gas, it was like this feeling of security. I, I spent 98% of the times I went to the gas station between the ages of 18 and 27, go, getting out of grad school, I was putting five or 10 bucks in at a time. So when I got the opportunity to put a full tank of gas in, I remember just feeling strong and whole that I had an entire a, a tank of gas. And a lot of times it was just random generosity. I'd park some woman's car and she'd give me 20 bucks or 50 bucks. So I've decided I'm going to be a baller. And what I would say to anyone who's in a position to take a hundred bucks, a thousand bucks through the course of this crisis and tip the lady who puts the food in your back seat, like, oh, you know, be a baller. And so that's one circle. How do you how do you just change people's lives on a small basis, on a regular basis? And then the, the larger circle is, okay, what organizations can you get involved in? Um, I just sent the dean an email. You know, what can you do to help organizations that have the infrastructure to really reach out to people? You know, Haas is so philanthropically minded that people who attend Haas, it's just built in their DNA. If you apply to Haas, it means you're coming from a place of being a global citizen, you know, beyond yourself. In terms of how you can, you know, help each other, I think this is an opportunity. You know, so many young people are are uh, don't have the, the awareness or the confidence to be really open with each other and to express their admirations and to form those kind of bonds. And my business partner of uh, of 35 years is from Haas. I have really strong friendships. I just got off the phone with a guy named Steve Shannon, who is my classmate who's the co-founder of Roku. Uh, there's, I, I think take advantage of this time and just be very open and, and honest with each other and strengthen those relationships and then go through their circles. Make sure you're fine. Make sure the people close to you are fine and then figure out how you can help people that you are never going to meet again. I think a decent test of character and code is doing things for people who you are never going to meet again or will never really have the opportunity to, to reflect their appreciation. So you know, I'm trying to do what I have not done, Jeff, and that is not just think good thoughts to try and put them into to try and operationalize those good thoughts. Um, that's, again, incredibly powerful. And I think I'm going to take that be a baller and uh, more importantly, character and code to heart. 
one of the things that I really appreciated about the algebra of happiness, you talked about the biggest investment anyone ever makes is in their chosen partner. I'm lucky I have a great partner, but maybe you can share some of the evaluation criteria. I had a virtue signal to my uh, soon to be wife, just so I don't get in trouble after this. <laughs> what are some of the things that you evaluate in a uh, partner and that people should evaluate in a partner before they make that investment taking away from just the business side? Uh, so there's a lot of research around this. And I asked my kids uh, in the last session of, of the course, what is the most important decision they'll make? And given that they're MBAs, they usually say stuff like the industry you choose or where you choose to live. Or the most important decision you will make, hands down, is who you decide to partner with. And when I say partner, it's specifically who you decide to have kids with. Because if you decide to have kids with somebody, you're partners for 25 years, whether you want to be partners or not. You can, you can, you can walk away from a house. You can walk away from business relationships. You can divorce your business partner, but there's really no walking away from somebody uh, uh, that you have kids with. And most people at your age expect to have kids. So that decision is the most important decision you'll make. And the three criteria that are uh, kind of shown to be the primary, if you will, building blocks of a successful partnership are one, sex and affection. You know, those things say communicate uh, that this relationship is singular and that I choose you, that is very important. Uh, young people tend to put 80% of their emphasis on that thing. And then the second and third are the second are values. And most people don't spend much time thinking about shared values or lack thereof. What role will religion play in your life? Where do you want to live? What is the role his or her parents will play in your life? Uh, do you ex How many kids do you want to have? What role will religion play in, that, in those kids' lives? And then the third thing that is actually the number one source of divorce, if you were to think about what takes people your age and people in their 30s off track, when you ask people what could really take someone off track, people say uh, illness. And the reality is illness is very ageist. There aren't that many people in their 20s or 30s that get sick. Uh, illness is, is mostly is a very ageist thing. It's not that. The thing that can really take you off track economically and emotionally is divorce. And so uh, picking the right partner is incredibly important, not only emotionally, but also financially. It, uh, uh, divorce is not only emotionally incredibly straining, it's economically ruinous. And the third thing that is the largest, actually the biggest cause for divorce, when you ask people, what is the number one reason people break up? They say, well, it's infidelity or a lack of shared values. It's not. People break up over money, specifically their approach to money. That is how, what economic weight class do they expect to be in? What is their approach to spending money? Who is responsible for maintaining that economic weight class? How do you approach your lifestyle? Do you have shared values around earning and spending money? This is the number one source of agita, of marital agita. And young people don't like to have those conversations because it feels crass. And so if you, any sort of religious pre preparation, if you speak to your rabbi, uh, you know, or your priest or what have you around marriage, the first thing to start talking about is values. I also think it's important to talk about what your expectations are in terms of uh, economics, because when those two don't foot to each other, it creates tremendous um, dislocation in the relationship. So most important decision, your partner, and then, um, and, and then those three things. And, you know, if I were to say, what is the goal? Like, what is the end goal? I've always thought that work is a fantastic way to develop confidence. I've always unfortunately gotten my identity from work. And as I get older, I realize that's a little bit unfortunate. But with, I think the goal is how do you put yourself, uh, how do you put yourself economically and spiritually in a position where you can just go all in on a relationship with your partner? And when I say all in, uh, you know, I'm divorced. I, I actually married a classmate and we ended up getting divorced. And when I look back on the, 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 the my shortcomings as a spouse, I was always keeping score. I was always saying, okay, if I'm not, if I, if her parents are over for the weekend, I would expect her to be nice to my parents. If I do this, I expect, I thought of it as a transaction and I was keeping score and I was making sure that I was either ahead or a nearly equivalent on the scorecard. And if there's any advice I would have to a young person, it's to put yourself in a position spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, and financially such that you can go all in on a relationship and commit to just being so far out ahead or trying to be of what they're giving you such that you don't keep score and decide that 
you want to be you want to always be in the plus column that you don't measure you don't keep score you're just going to go all in on the relationship and i didn't figure that out until i was 40 in my 40s and i think my friendship suffered it cost me my first marriage and it created a lot of uh, it held me back from a lot of happiness so put yourself in a position where you can go all in once you evaluate and find the right partner and just commit to their happiness and well-being. Thank you, Professor Galloway. I, I think that's incredibly helpful to us as a, as a community and as people are making that future decision. The last question here, uh, before we open it up to questions, is how can we as current Hasi, soon-to-be Haas graduates, reach out to alumni at this time? How how do you think we could best do that? I kind of just slid into your email box unprovoked. I probably could have found a better way of doing that. How would you advise that we do it in the future? I think it's email. I mean, I, I try, I try. So when I got out, of, I started a kind of a brand strategy firm in my second year. And my only experience was I'd spent two years in Morgan Stanley. I had absolutely no license to be in the field of brand strategy other than I'd taken brand strategy my second year. You know, and who are my first clients? Dryers, Levi's, and Williams Sonoma. Jeff, what do those three firms have in common? All Haas graduates. All the All CEOs went to Haas. And this was my rap. My name is, I called them. Can you call me back? I called Rick Kronk, Howard Lester, and Bob Haas. And I said, can you call me back? I'm a recent grad or I'm graduating in May and I have an idea, will you speak to me? They all called me back. I'm not sure I'd do that. I don't return all the calls I get. I'm embarrassed, but I don't return all the calls I get. All three of these guys called me back. And I said, I'm a Haas grad. I'm starting a business. Will you help me? Can, will you get me a meeting? And I remember walking into Williams-Sonoma and Howard Lester got me a meeting with the CMO, Pat Connolly. And Pat picked up the phone and talked to Howard and put up the phone and said, I have no idea what you, who you are, or what you do. I've just been told I have to hire you. I have to use your company. And that's what, you know, that's what it meant to be a Haas grad was that William Sonoma became a client of a, of a second year MBA starting a brand strategy firm whose sum total of marketing experience was being in the fixed income department of Morgan Stanley. So, you know, I wouldn't, a couple of things. I wouldn't be afraid to email people. You have to obviously use your EQ to decide when you're bothering them. Um, but I wouldn't maybe be a, a, a reticent to maybe ping them a second time if you don't hear back from them. And I would also develop thick skin. Many or most are not going to get back to you because they're busy and have their own lives, but some will. And people do want to help. Uh, 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 so look, I, you know, you're, 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 one of the algorithms I have in my book around happiness is success is a function of your resilience, um, of your, your, is perseverance over failure, which equals resilience. Everyone, everyone uh, of your classmates will know failure. You will all know tragedy. You will all at some point get fired. You will at some point not get the promotion you deserve. At some point, someone less talented than you will be hired over you. Personally, you will face tragedy. Someone you, someone you know and love will get sick and die. Um, success is not this, success is this. And the key to success is your ability that when bad things happen to you, to mourn for a little while and then to move on and to recognize there's a statute of limitations around mourning. And if you aren't getting beyond something, if you get fired, give yourself two weeks to feel angry about your, your boss, feel, feel sorry for yourself and then move on. But put a statute of limitations on it and then decide if you're not out of that funk, if you haven't moved on, you need to reach out for help. And that's not an easy thing to do. But resilience is a function of perseverance over, uh, over failure. I've had businesses fail. I've had businesses go chapter 11. Uh, I've had marriages fail. You know, I woke, I've had times when I had a ton of money and then I had times when I had a lot less money than I thought I was going to have. And 2008, you know, I got run over. I mean, run over by the recession. I was long tech stocks. I was, you know, 2007, I was looking at planes and thought I could do no wrong. By 2000, early 2009, you know, my son, my oldest son had the bad judgment to come rotating out of my girlfriend and I'm sitting there and I'm 42 and I don't have, I'm not nearly as economically secure as I thought I was going to be. And I just thought, God, I'm just a failure. I'm just a chocolate mess failure. And what you realize is that nothing is ever as good as bad as it seems. And I got up, I felt sorry for myself for a little while, but I got off, I dusted off my pants and I started another company. 
So your ability, success is just a function of your willingness to get beamed in the face, I mean in the face, and then get up, dust off your pants, and get to the plate again, another sports metaphor, and swing harder. Because just get ready. You will know failure. The, almost all of you will not be senator or have a fragrance named after you, despite what Dean Harrison tells you you're capable of. So get ready. But the key is, if you keep trying, if you keep trying, I mean, it, you know, it, you will, you will get there. But be clear, you're gonna get beamed in the face. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, and we're all gonna get ready for that. Uh, I'm gonna pass it over to Johanna, and we're gonna move to the questions from the audience. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. Thank Gallo. you, Jeffrey. Awesome. Yeah. So we have about 15 minutes for audience questions. We've got a lot of great. Uh, questions coming in over the chat. So I'll start with Greg's question. He says, since education and healthcare will be so disrupted in the next 12 to 18 months, would you advise newly graduated students with an interest in entrepreneurship to focus on ed tech and health healthcare tech? I think those are great sectors. A lot of it is opportunistic, but if you have a passion for that field and you have a vision for something, yeah, I think it's I think those are going to be incredible sectors. Education between corporate learning and L&D is supposed to be a 10 trillion dollar market by 2030. Healthcare is 16, 17 percent of our economy. So I think those are great sectors. If you have a vision or capabilities that lend themselves to that, I think that's a fantastic place to start a company. So, uh, yes, full stop. Awesome. All right. Um, this one comes from Fede, uh, one of my classmates as well. He says, welcome home, Scott. Could you tell us a bit about your Prof G strategy course? Why have, what have you learned about the future of online education by doing it? And by the way, he says the course was awesome. Oh, thanks, Fede. Yeah, I, I, I think I met him last night. So look, I, at NYU, my class is $7,000. So 170 kids take my class. That's $1.2 million in tuition, most of it taken on in debt, which results in kids getting married later, not starting businesses, buying homes later, buying stocks later. I think that we have kind of lost the script. And, it, and I'm not a modest person. I'm good, maybe even great at what I do. But to charge young people $100,000 a night, that's what we are charging. For me, for two hours and 40 minutes in front of PowerPoint, we're asking students at NYU to pay $100,000 every night. 1.2 million over 12 nights. I think that is a, I think that is just plain wrong. <laughs> I, 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 that is a big problem. And I worry that we're preying on the hopes and dreams of middle-class parents who continue to encourage their kids to go to school at any cost. And so, you know, my vision for this, and I want to be clear, it's not purely, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not altruistic. It's a for-profit company is I'm trying to figure out a way to take 30 or 40 or maybe 50% of my class and in terms of the learnings, the constructs, the models. I can't offer the certification. I can't offer the in the in classroom experience. I can't offer the networking, but give them 30 to 50% of the class for 7% of the price. So charge 500 bucks, do somewhere between 20 and 50% of the seats reserved for scholarship. But I think online education is interesting. You know, I wanna teach, you know, my goal personally is I've taught 4,500 students since I joined the faculty at NYU. I would like to teach 45,000 in the next 10 years, and I'm going to need technology to do that. Uh, so I'm, we've started an online education company. We're learning. We just started. Um, we'll probably, you know, at some point partner with some universities. But I think there's, I think there's, you know, something's got to give. And I don't know if I hope, I, I think I had breakfast with Dean Harrison, and we're trying to figure out how do we, how do we use technology not to take the soul from learning, but to expand it and offer more opportunities to more people. Um, and I don't know if it's a hybrid model. I think the winners will probably be Microsoft will partner with Berkeley and and do something really big. But um, I want to see if we can build something that that attempts at a very small level to to teach to teach to offer a, a small portion of what I received in brand strategy um, for a fraction of the cost. I'm gonna give you a question from Sam Atwood, who's actually a second year that's one of my mentors. How do you suggest that we invest in our institution of the future while not borrowing from future generations? And take that however you want to go with it. Higher taxes. I mean, you know, it's a zero sum game. I, I just look and it, I'm preaching here. So 
and I'm trying to walk the walk. It, when I sold my company L2, there's something called 1202, where your first $10 million as an entrepreneur is tax-free. That just makes no sense. Why? In my, because most of my capital gains, most of my income is now through capital gains. I pay a lower tax rate than the majority of people graduating from Haas next year. That makes no sense to me. So I think we need to fundamentally rethink our tax structure. Billionaire, and I'm not a billionaire, but billionaires used to pay 60 to 70 percent uh, or 50 percent in the 50s and 70 percent in the 70s. And now they pay 17 percent. So if we're not going to finance this party, this continued party of baby boomers with by by. I mean, all we if, if you think about money, money is nothing but the transfer of work and time from one agency to another. When you give me money, you're giving me the ability to work less and spend more time with my family. So we've decided in order to maintain the wealth of baby boomers and people like myself, we're going to steal time and 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 time, time with family and work from future generations. I mean, your kids are going to have to pay this stuff back. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know how we get there without fundamentally rethinking a return to a progressive tax structure. Uh, when I sold L2, I gave a large portion of my proceeds to nonprofits, including um, L2, because I recognized that, quite frankly, I wasn't paying my fair share. You know, I, I have I have taken massively, taken massively. I, you know, California taxpayers lifted me by the scruff of my neck and literally f flung me into the future. And in exchange for letting me into UCLA, I rewarded them with smoking a shit ton of pot and watching Planet of the Apes over and over and getting a 2.27 GPA. And then a godsend, this woman named Fran Hill, who was the director of admissions at Berkeley, for some reason decided to let me in with a 2.27 GPA and let me attend school for about $1,000 a year. So I came out of undergrad and grad with a total uh, uh, $7,500 debt and I had the wherewithal and the absence of student debt to start a company. So, you know, I recognized when I finally, the moons lined up and I was able to sell a company at a great return that I needed to give some of that back. I shouldn't feel that need to give back. We should have a more progressive tax structure. We should have, you can't spend, you can't have four and a half trillion dollars in tax receipts and spend five and a half trillion. I mean, sure, you do that during war, you do that to get us out of a recession, but you don't do it you don't do it in 2019 when the economy is booming. It's just basic math. And I worry that we have just become so short term and everything we do is about maintaining the wealth of the rich. If if the market crashed, Jeffrey, you know who benefits? You and your classmates would benefit. The reason why I have my life right now, one of the reasons why I was able to buy Netflix at $12 in 2010. If stocks went down, if businesses went out of business, guess what? You would benefit from that because you might get the opportunity to buy San Francisco real estate for 700 bucks a foot instead of 1500 bucks a foot. It's important that we let markets fall and crash. And we've decided to take money from the younger generation and future generations to maintain the wealth of my generation. When I got out of Berkeley, and I'm really on my soapbox now, I, I spent a total of of $10,000 total tuition, undergrad and grad, and I had a job at $100,000, 10 to one ratio. I didn't take the job, I started a company. My first house in Potrero Hill was $280,000 and my tuition was 10,000, so that was 28 to one. Now it's, I'm sorry, uh, I could buy a house, I, my, my job to my tuition was 10 to one. Now I think your tuition and your average job is about one to one. A house in the Bay Area costs 1.4 million now. I mean, it's just, it, we have affected through monetary and fiscal policy. We have basically, we have basically decided to transfer money from your generation to my generation, and that's not enough. So we're transferring money from your kids to my generation. So uh, there's no easy way out. We can't grow out of this. We're going to have to fundamentally rethink our tax structure. It's, re it's insane that the wealthiest man in the world is the mother of all welfare queens and doesn't pay any taxes, Jeff Bezos. Uh, if you took subsidies to his organization and timed, times it by 0.17, his net worth, you would find that Jeff Bezos is actually a welfare recipient, that he is receiving more money from the government than he is putting in. We need a progressive tax structure. We need to move away from this gross idolatry of innovators, and we need some equity back in our tax system, and we need to start investing in our future, the way the way California taxpayers invested in my future, uh, in my future, Jeff.
I I agree in every bit of that uh, analysis. I'm going to go with our last question here uh, from Ryan Cardiff, who says, big fan of the newsletter. Is there a way that you can connect with high schools or colleges to make your Corona Core idea happen? And please feel free to uh, uh, illuminate that a little bit more. I heard about it on your podcast earlier today. Uh, his sister is graduating high school and is in love with the idea of helping out and giving back. Um, so, Jeff, what branch of the armed services were you in? I was a field artillery officer in the Army. So one of the reasons that in the 50s and 60s we experienced in America some of the most productive and bipartisan legislation throughout the history of our country is that the majority of our leaders had a shared experience in the armed services. And they, there's this there's this saying that there are no atheists in foxholes. I think there's no conservatives or progressives in foxholes. I think that when you are under fire, when you are serving uh, something greater than yourself, that you develop a certain comity and camaraderie and brotherhood and sisterhood that is able to bring Americans together and it's such that we can accomplish uh, wonderful things. I think we have lost that. And part of the reason we lost that is there's not as many of our leaders who have a shared experience. I also look at the pandemic and I believe that the key to our recovery as a society and, uh, and hoping that we don't lose our superpowers and nation as our optimism is flattening the apex, apex of the relapse. If this thing comes back bigger and badder in the fall, it's gonna be very ugly. So the key to that is testing, tracing, and isolation, and also distancing. And I worry that the weak link around all of this is tracing. And I was on the phone, I'm name dropping right now. I was on the phone with Mark Benioff this afternoon talking about the role that Salesforce might be able to play in providing technology for tracing. But right now there's 2,500 tracers in the United States that mostly focus on STDs and foodborne illnesses. And I think if we took three to 500,000 tracers uh, it could be very effective because the difference, it, literally tracing is a matter of hours that you need to find immediately all the people have been exposed, let them know they've been exposed so they can go into isolation. I also think there's a huge opportunity because people under the age of 25 are being faced with a decision around maybe they should take a gap year because I think a lot of us in academia are going to need a year to figure this stuff out to make sure that the experience is this hybrid, blended, great experience there's gonna be some growing pains. So I think there's an opportunity for a lot of gap years. I think a lot of young people are not as emotionally mature as they should be to be dropped off at campus. So I love the idea of a shared sort of service or a Peace Corps or the, uh, what the uh, Latter-day Saints do with mission, what people like yourself do who choose to put yourself in harm's way. But the, the incredible thing about this army would be you're no less or more immune from bullets than I am, but you're more immune from the bullets of Corona. And that is, I'm not an epidemiologist, but the majority of science and data shows that it is a different proposition if you were to contract the virus than if I contracted it. And so a building an army of 18 to 25 year olds that spend one to two years in the agency of others and be, develop this army of tracers. And then in exchange for that, we give them somewhere between 25 and 100 percent tuition remission at the college of their choice. The total cost of those quarter to a half a million kids, including uh, tuition remission, would be 50 billion dollars, which is two percent of the two and a half trillion dollar stimulus. The way I think of it is a two and a two percent insurance policy or warranty that dramatically reduces the likelihood we'll be hit with another two and a half trillion dollars in stimulus. In addition, we need, we need this, this sense of shared service and greatness in the agency of others that people like yourself who have a background in the armed services, people in Israel have with mandatory conscription. We need a sense, we need to get back to the notion, we need a generation of leaders that see that, that greatness is in the agency of others that look left, look right to their brothers and sisters and put America first because there is, there is a level of bipartisanship that is unproductive. We have an enemy. Let's let's assemble. Let's assemble an army of super soldiers. I think they're ready. I think there's going to be a lot of them because of uh, the appeal of a gap year. So my feeling is, let's arm them and let's get on this. Awesome, great, great words to end on. Yes. Very proud thing. Uh, this is unfortunately all the time we have. We're right up at the top of the hour. Scott, I want to thank you so much on behalf of myself, Jeff, and NBAA, and our, my entire class of Hossies. Uh, thank you, Dean Harrison, for being with us. Uh, and thanks to everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, we hope you have a great rest of your evening. Thanks so much. Stay safe.